Okay, we're live. Okay, welcome everyone to Mediascope's live Friday chat. Today we're here to talk about women in media, uh, Peggy's List, the new event gender audit that I released through Mediascope's newsletter this morning. And of course, we'll talk about the events and topics of our media week. And as we were just saying, there's certainly been quite uh, quite a lot of activity regarding women in media and advertising through a comment from Cindy Gallup. So I really want to welcome everyone for joining us, both those who are viewing us live and, of course, the panellists. So first, Chris Edwards from DMG. It's not DMG anymore, though, Chris. What's the name of your business? Uh, we were just bought by the French. The French are coming, and that's a good thing. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Um, and Chris, of course, you uh, curate and put together the content, particularly for ad tech. So we thought it was a good idea to get your comments today on the gender diversity within events and just the issues and challenges that you find in getting more women involved in your events, because I know that you particularly call out call out for them. Uh, Jane Huxley from Pandora, a uh, big advocate. Hi, Jane. <laughs> a big advocate for women in our industry. It'd be great to get your views today. And of course, oh, there we go. Right there. It's just that we've got the Holler Agency up there with the nice logo behind you. So I thought I'd, uh, you know, show Get up there. This is someone, I've got a photo of a monkey. Um. <laughs> That's good. I should, I should get a media scope thing, actually. The first week that I did this, four or five weeks ago, I think I might have told you I had my washing basket behind me. Um, <laughs> that's just to the right here now, so I've pushed it out of sight now. Um, and, of course, Alex Allwood from the Holler Agency. Alex, are you still in, up there, Brady Bunch? Mm -hmm. Alex, are you still also involved in the Gender Diversity Council at Comms Council? No, my role's finished there. I sat uh, and chaired... Um, on that working group for three years um, and that role finished last year. Well, it would be wonderful to get your views through that experience, uh, even if it has finished. So let's begin the discussion. Like any good discussion and any good debate, I think we should start with looking at the good things. So um, I'm always too quite mindful when we're talking about women in media and advertising that we come from a lens of... <laughs> Um, people who are debating this issue from a very privileged position. Um, as far as women, women's issues globally, um, these are really the issues that, um, that I'd like to have. We're not facing a lot of issues that women uh, indeed in Australia and indeed globally are facing, but that doesn't mean that we, um, that, that we don't, um, you know, that we shouldn't be debating, we shouldn't be trying to, to do something a little better in our own little corner of the world. So first of all, if we can start on the good things that are going on in the market for women, and there are some, there are many good things that are going on. So I thought we should start there. Also to get a sense from each of you on what we could perhaps do to improve the current status quo. Uh, Alex, if we can perhaps start with you. I think that it, it, there's no, there's been no better time to be a woman, a woman uh, these days. I think. Uh, Lots has lots have changed. Um, our position has changed um, in society. Um, we seem to be, um, you know, uh, there are more uh, women um, graduating from university. Um, in fact, the only in the last twelve months, I think, more women graduated uh, than men uh, graduated. We have um, big changes afoot. Uh, at the top end of town in terms of uh, organisational culture and workplace and ensuring that there's diversity um, within those, within those organisations. And what they're endeavouring endeavor to do is create um, environments where everybody is accepted um, and everyone is given an equal opportunity to do the best work that they can possibly do. And you only have to look at um, companies like uh, Commonwealth Bank or Telstra um, and their diversity programs and, and, and what they're looking at doing in terms of organisation transformation um, and the next generation of women that are, are looking to enter the workforce um, are going to be certainly given an equal opportunity in terms of performance. 
Uh, that's really true, Alex. And I'm also reminded um, from your comments about some of our larger organisations about PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, globally, they now have a, a flexible workforce. Um, and, you know, I think the thought behind that is that they want to treat their employees as adults. Uh, and it doesn't have to be between the nine to five kind of, um, you know, structure that we've been so used to. And that seems to be just from speaking to a couple of people I know at PwC, they've all really embraced it. And certainly it's put PwC as an employee, employer of choice. Uh, Chris, um, good things that you can see happening for women in our industry, um, certainly through your lens with ad tech. Um, and any comments on some great women speakers that you've seen? Or that you get involved in your events? Look, I come from a family of very strong women. I find it really bizarre. In 2015, we're having a debate about women's entitlement to be on stage and that we even have diversity programs just around sex. That's just absolutely nuts. I think I looked at last year, I had 250 people apply to be on stage at AdTech, of which less than 10% were female. And this year was almost exactly the same. And um, I think it comes back to what HP found with their internal study a few years ago that women will only apply for a role or a task if they're 100% confident, where guys will if they're 60%. And that's been my whole career, to be perfectly honest. So I, I, it's great because we have the Jenny Williams and we have the Gail Kellys. We have these great people in the industry, Joe Pollard, whatever, and all of you on the phone as well too, standing up. But um, yeah, it's, it still stymies me that um, women in the industry can't support other women in the industry, the ones who are already speaking up, to actually just find the voice. Yep, I agree. Uh, Rachel has said... That's the issue, though. Without a formal process, it doesn't happen. Agencies are terrible at formalising how they recruit and manage staff development. So a comment there from one of our, our viewers. Jane, your views on the good things that are happening in the industry um, and also what can perhaps be done uh, a little better? Uh, thanks, Denise, and hi, everybody. Um, there is a lot uh, going on that's fantastic, as Alex and Chris have already pointed out. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, out in the market supporting women's groups, supporting organisations, uh, and equally, you know, that happens for men and men with potential as well. So I'm always careful in a debate like this to ensure that we are evenly balanced. You know, there's, there's no question that there are issues, but I think that we also need to be mindful of what's fair versus what's right. Um, and, and to some of Chris's points there, we talk about application and invitation and those types of things when we're looking at, at uh, joining in with women, et cetera. It's almost time that we started to look at the curation model as well as those self-selected types of things. You know, when I talk to people, quite frankly, they say a little bit like me, I'm really busy. I didn't know it was on. You know, I didn't, you know, I'm not involved. Uh, I was traveling. Like, there's, there's lots of reasons why people are not participating that go beyond just being invited. And, and I think a curation model, particularly for something like ad tech, but also more broadly in the industry where we're curating content, uh, and of course it's near and dear to our heart at Pandora, but curating content for the target rather than leaving it open for people to want to be included. So, Jane, the submission process, which currently a lot of our industry, I mean, I... The uh, gender event, or sorry, the event gender order I released through Mediascope's newsletter today. I looked at 18 of our industry events. Chris, of course, AdTech was one of the events that was included, as was your content, um, content event that happened, I think, in September. I also looked at events such as Mumbrella 360, some Amy events, uh, some Adma events, and um, basically the 18 events came through at 27% women. Uh, some certainly were better than others. I did find it really interesting that uh, some of the events from the traditional medias or the so-called traditional media, so radio and newspaper, were particularly low, uh, to say the least. Um, that 27% seemed to be about, about where it sat. Uh, Jane made the point of a, a mixture of submission events plus curated events, and that's really what the 18 were. Uh, Chris, you're on maybe moving to more of a curated model than a submission model? Well, it's interesting. When I went up on uh, Peggy's list and asked, are there any more women out there who want to apply? The only people who got back to me that were negative were women saying, we just don't want to be on stage because we're women. 
And I had to go back and be very open and say, no, you'll still be there on merit. I just want you to apply. Yeah. So we've got ad tech in New Zealand next week, next Tuesday, with 42% of our, um, our speakers are women. And that took a lot of work, to be perfectly honest, because we're, it's, it's really mm -hmm. weird. And I think it's just something we need to work through as an industry. And I'm sitting here as the token male on this Brady Bunch moment saying we just need to support more women to say, yeah, you have a voice and you're equally um, worthy of being in that spot as whoever else it might be that's male. Mm. I, like I, I uh, move very much from a problem in terms of not enough women, not enough women in the pipeline to a symptom because this is an issue that's been around for five or plus more years. We know about it. Um, there is a lot of discussion and white papers and uh, problem solving around this issue. So um, as an industry, we need to move from what it, it, from this is a problem to now this is a symptom and what are we going to put in place to help to bring more women into the funnel? Now, you, I had a look at your, your, your list in terms of your audit. You know, maybe, the, maybe having a look at um, those events that are doing it really well in terms of double AMI. I looked at their, their statistic, 50%, 50-50. And, and what it tells me is that they're saying, to, saying of their speakers, 50-50, if not, why not? And what do we need to put in place that's going to ensure that we have more women in the funnel so that we can get um, more women on stage? And this might be going to looking at your processes the process is where that you, um, in, in, in reviewing candidates, you have equal numbers of men and women reviewing um, uh, those applications. It might be that you're doing blind applications based on expertise that that person brings to the table. We know that like will, will appoint like. Um, and, and, and so we, look, we need to look at strategies um, rather than, than, the, than the symptom of not enough women. Um, and I think that that's an interesting point, Alex. I think a lot of um, what we're talking about today with particularly events and a lot of the issues that we've seen come up this week through uh, through the Leo Burnett, Cindy Gallup uh, issues, they are all symptoms of a much bigger picture issue um, than perhaps there is some things that we can put in place. Jane, your comments um, on... Uh, just touching what, on what Alex said, but what can we do, particularly with events, to get more women talking? And what are the issues around it? It's not just they're submitting. To me, it's also, you know, you touched yeah. on it before. It's a busyness thing. It's a confidence thing. It's a I don't have anything to say thing. And, you know, some women also don't have the need to speak at events. That's all fine. But we yeah. also do wonder why there aren't so many women up there on the, on the stage. Look, I think there's a couple of things, Denise. Um, you know, great women know great women. You know, when I get invited to speak at something, I almost always I would be able to provide additional speakers to that event. Uh, yes. And that may be one way to do it. And I'd be very, very happy to do that. The second thing is that, you know, we have a value equation that's associated with giving our time to an event or really to most things that we do. And perhaps for a woman to participate, and this may be true of a lot of men that we don't see around the industry very often, the value equation needs to be a little bit stronger. I might come to an event to talk about a topic such as the mobile industry, the market, the music market, where it's all going, you know, the benefit of my, my years in business and sharing stories from that. But at the end of the day, I've got to sell advertising for Pandora, right? So, you know, a, a closer link to the value equation for getting people to come along, that might also be a way of me using my time, not only to benefit the industry, my peers, young people with potential, but also of doing my day job, which is selling advertising on Pandora. And quite often, you know, when you go to an event, oh, you, we stay away from that. This is not commercial. This is not a message. I get all that, but maybe an opportunity to be able to buy my trade uh, as well as give the industry the benefit of my experience and wisdom. I, it's, it's just a thought. It's out there. I, I don't think that will work for anybody. But the yep. value equation is something that I think is really carefully considered by women when they say yes. And that's a really good point. But Chris, 
Oh, Chris, you there? Yeah, Chris sorry, it's uh, dropping out a bit. Right. Chris, how does that fit in? I mean, the biggest, you know, the biggest issue that I hear when we're talking about events is the audience does not want to be sold to. So with Jane's comment, just how do we, you know, how does that kind of fit? Well, it's interesting, just before we went live, I said, I've got this idea called the Aardvark Paradox. And so, ah! so the idea is that the Aardvark is the first word in the dictionary, right, because of the double A's, and that's the way guys approach the world. We want to be first. But what people yeah. know about Aardvarks is they're intensely private, and that's the woman's side of this as well too. So I think we've got to move past I'm trying to be up there to extol my virtues and be seen, which is the way that guys tend to present, and to I have merit and I have something to deliver that's worthwhile, irrespective of my fear of being seen. I'd, I'd like to see that, and that would work for me. Yeah, and I'm not necessarily talking about a hard sell in an event, um, you know, but but just that opportunity to participate around the event, because I completely agree. And the last thing that I want to do is get up and sell Pandora to an audience that actually wants to hear about, you know, something else. But and the value equation may mean something different, you know, to other women as well. And I think one of the ideas that you had, Denise, around Peggy's list in particular was this idea of providing people with the training and a set of skills to be able to participate on the stage or in a panel. And, you know, the value equation might actually be providing some training, some tips, uh, you know, some experience from those of us who've done it for a long time prior to them taking the stage. And, you know, I'd be happy to give them 10 top tips for participating in a panel, you know, the day yep. before or the benefit of my experience on being on stage, how to deal with nerves, how to construct your content. You know, maybe that could be part of the value exchange. But there needs to be more than just turning up on the day, saying your thing and, and then leaving and then wondering what happens. Well, I think women also prepare differently as well, and that's exactly that. I mean, it's um, that's building the confidence level, and that's going to be you, Jane, as a boss, or you, Alex, or Denise, saying to someone, yeah, you can do it. Now, here's the way I'd do it, and just kind of feathering people up that way. Yeah. Um, and, look, I'll take any of that content from you as well, too, to help our speakers, because women are the first ones to actually ask for it. So, and I'll be very happy to share that. Excellent. And I'm, I'm going to put tips on that, too, Jane. Cool. Sorry? I'm about to go and mobile on I have to find a, um, cord because my battery's about to die. So you guys keep chatting. I'm just going to go for a walk around my house. This is my place. Ah. Ah. Very nice, Chris. Now, this, ah. is the this is the bedroom. No secrets here. Oh, hang on. <laughs> All right. We're, we're back. Sorry about that. Working for home. Very good, Chris. Alex, um, your views on, you know, getting more women to speak, what are the issues surrounding it? Uh, if we can, um, if you can comment. I, um, I'm a little bit more um, of responsibility lying in the organiser or the organisation. So I'm, I will all, I'm having a, you know, pro, let's get in the game by changing our, our, our processes. Um, yep. and, and, and that starts from changing the mindset and that comes from the top. Whoever is the um, organisation's organiser for the event or the company or the brand, needs to have a mindset of 50-50, uh, if not, why not? And what do we need to do to, ch to change that status quo? Now, a lot of the top performing organisations have put a diversity council in place. And this diversity council is made up from a range of senior executives um, from right across the organisation that look at that particular issue. Um, in terms of inclusion um, of their broader work workforce, or in our case, in specific to events, inclusion of more women um, and more diverse speakers. I mean, one of the uh, issues with the uh, Burnett's appointment um, was that it wasn't just all male, but it was all pale as well. So uh, what we're looking for is a, a broader attitude or a change in mindset um, to get, getting diversity. Can and I, I, and I, Sorry, go, Jane. Alex. I was just about to ask, I think going 50-50 is where the PC debate went pear-shaped in the 80s. When we start to mandate that half of the board or half of the executive team needs to be female or black, white or brindle, I think we get a real problem mm -hmm. because resentment happens. The biggest thing we can't be doing as an industry is actually having men resenting the fact we're going to slot women in 
because we have to. I think, um, and, and not to fully disagree, I know there's merit in your argument. I just think it's got to be done in a slightly different way. Um, I don't even know what the answer is. To be I wonder if anything's going to change, Chris, by leaving the status quo as it is. I mean, we've had very, very little shift in terms of women in senior executive roles right across our, uh, our industry. We've had very, very little uh, change in terms of women heading up um, uh, organisations, in, either in independent agencies or multinationals. Nothing's changed. Um, it's very comfortable the way it is. What's going to shake the industry up? Is that going to be targets? Is that going to be legislations to make a change? I don't know. But, you know... It's, it's status quo, things stay the same. Okay, well, I, mean, I recognise that. I'll say events will be the fastest to change because we're putting about 35 40% of our audience, um, our speakers next year will be female in Sydney. Count great. Well done. That's a really good. Uh, can I just uh, comment? Um, everything I try and do with Peggy's list and my initiatives with women in media, for me, it's small, intentional steps. I try and uh, really, t everything I'm doing tries to offer tangible value. So Peggy's List is an example of that. And really that was born through the LinkedIn group that I, we are Women in Media and Advertising LinkedIn group that I host. So every time I would put a post up that showed the number of um, the gender diversity at events, the comments that I received. So Peggy's List was really born from that. The next step for Peggy's List in a couple of weeks, I'll be launching Don's List. Now, Don's List um, is an initiative where I will literally be approaching men yeah. and saying to them, similar to the panel pledge, because we can't do this alone. Mm -hmm. So it's similar to the panel pledge. It won't be saying don't speak at events that don't have a reasonable gender diversity, but it will be asking them to ask the question of the event organisers. Next year, um, yes, there are some workshops planned and the theme of those workshops will be building confidence for competent women uh, because I see that as such a huge uh, reason um, for, you know, th these symptoms that we're talking about. And hopefully, Chris is gone, uh, hopefully that will, um, if Chris has had enough, <laughs> hopefully, he'll, I'm sure he'll try and come back in now. Hopefully that will, um, you know, that will also spread into many other areas of a woman's uh, professional and personal life in terms of yeah. asking for maternity leave, um, asking for that promotion and so yes. on. I see it as a real fundamental um, issue that I think is, you know, relatively easy, yeah. hard, whatever to work on. Jane, your comments? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I... When you're looking at making a, a change like this, it is a significant change that you can, you can kind of look at it from the top down and from the bottom up. And I really do believe that things like Peggy's List, anything that we can do to build confidence in a lot of people, it all helps from the bottom up. And, and you know, when I go out into the market and talk to a lot of groups like this, I'm literally trying to affect change one person at a time. And you work on the theory of paying it forward, right? So I hope that if I help somebody, then they're going to help others. And again, great programs like the Marketing Academy, groups like She Says, Little Girl, Big Dreams, uh, groups like the Women in Focus from the Commonwealth Bank, Ruby from Westpac. There's plenty out there that are trying yeah. to address the issues from the bottom up, which is great because over time, right. volume wins. From the mm -hmm. top down, I think that, you know, some of the comments that Alex is making there on the bigger picture, we need to be able to impact that a little bit more effectively. And I see that as being incumbent on those of us who are in roles, in managing director or chief executive roles, seats on boards. The top-down stuff really does come back to the few. And I think that I am increasingly seeing a lot more women taking that extraordinarily seriously. Pip Marlow at Microsoft, Cass Stocks at Twitter, um, Catherine Powell at Disney, you know, myself at Pandora. There are women now who are really agitating very strongly in our markets. You know, um, Kelly Bayer Rosmarin in finance. There's hundreds of us. And I do think that although in a short period of time, it feels like we're not making significant change, 
when you're talking about the top down, you've got to zoom out to five and 10 year timeframes. And yeah. actually, I think we're making a lot of change. And I fundamentally believe that by the time my two girls who are now six and nine, Satan and Lucifer, I like to call them. By the time <laughs> they're coming through, I genuinely believe that they will not have the issues that we're having now. And, I, you know, I make it my business to make sure that's the case, but it's going to take hundreds of us and strong voices like the voice of Alex there who feel that we do need to fix a wrong, we need to right a wrong, my approach is that I need to feel that what I'm doing is fair and I care more about fair than right. Some people yeah. care more about right than fair. And when we get a blend, we are absolutely making changes. Yeah. Great comments, Jane. Alex, uh, just to your final comments on this, I do want to touch on the Leo Burnett thing quite quickly and then we'll move on to um, other events of the media week. But Alex, your comments on uh, on women talking at events, initiatives like Peggy's List, other things that you're seeing going on in the market? Yeah. Look, my biggest concern is that we've, we're seeing change uh, uh, on those uh, top 100 ASX list companies. We're seeing that change um, and we're seeing a change that's progressive um, and that's offering diversity. Now, uh, this is what the next generation of employee is looking for. They're looking for progressive organisations, diverse organisations. So if, if we are, are not uh, changing our industry quickly, then we are going to see and experience an exodus of talent from the industry because we're all competing for the same thing. The new competitive advantage is the talent that's within the organisation. And we're all competing for the same thing. So if those organisations, those top 100 ASX, are, 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 have got a stronger offer than our industry, guess where the talent lies? Not in our industry, but in other industries. That's exactly right. Um, I, sat next, sorry, I sat next to um, a head of a creative agency at a dinner on Tuesday night. Um, and this was before the Cindy Gallup thing kind of hit during the week. And, you know, when you look at the makeup um, of the Communication Council, I highlighted that on a page today on Mediascope. Um, when you look at the, the, gender, the gender split just for all employees, it is absolutely 50-50. But when you look at creative, uh, that's when it's like 70% men, 30% women in that department. Interestingly, of course, accounts department, 70% women, 30% men. All of the stats that I've seen in the last day or so, women are the doers, um, absolutely. Where the, the account managers, the planners, the accounts people, uh, the implementation experts and so on. Um, so, you know, that was certainly interesting. Um, but he said that women get to a certain age, they start thinking about children and family and then they go client side because agencies at the moment just can't accommodate perhaps the need for flexibility uh, and so on. So that's perhaps why we're seeing a little bit of, you know, the discussion that's happened today um, through Cindy or this week through Cindy Gallup and Leo Burnett. Jane, uh, have you seen the Leo Burnett, Cindy Gallup um, issues this week and what are your general comments? Yeah, I have and I apologise for the noise in the background here today. We are about to host a live performance of the Jungle Giants here in the offices at Pandora. I can hear them warming up out there um, and so I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, very, very hipster, very cool here at Pandora. I, of course, you know, my team are very, very excited. Um, <laughs> I think that's it. When, while you're talking, I was just sort of thinking and, and reflecting on creative campaigns that have really changed issues. And one that, that comes to mind for a lot of us is the Dove campaign around changing perceptions around body image for women. And they've particularly done a very good job of that, but a number of companies have done it. I wonder what a campaign would look like to look at this issue of equality and fairness in, you know, applications and, and, and jobs, you know, blind interviews, merit-based interviews, you know, masking and voice masking people as they're applying for jobs. Maybe there is a creative and, you know, interesting and fun way uh, to address that. And maybe, you know, as an interest, as an industry, we should look at, you know, maybe mounting a campaign 
that strikes into the heart of women not taking these jobs, you know, in a really creative and interesting way. I think, you know, with the Leo Burnett stuff, there's a part of me that just says, you know, that is a result of the people who apply, right, as opposed to a carefully selected group of white men, you know, representing a cross-section of brands. It comes right back to what Chris was saying before around application and invitation versus yes. what I call curation and selection. And yes. you know, somewhere in the middle are the answers around how to create the type of diversity that does actually reflect the markets and the people that we're speaking to. These are, they're not, you know, easy issues to solve. I feel that they perhaps were unfairly held up in some cases because I'm sure that homogeneity exists across many, many teams. But in a case, it might be the wake-up call that a lot of people need. Um, and fantastic women who want to balance work and life and family and babies and a great career can come and work here at Pandora with me. Ah, <laughs> <Bravo. Such> a... <laughs> Um, well, I mean, you can see that I've, you know, I, as you know, Jane, because we've known each other for a long time, I've, you know, Mediascope is a testament to me wanting more flexibility. Um, I've hung in there and I've hung in there and, you know, traction does seem to have finally having a brief glimpse at me, which is wonderful. Um, but, you know, I've done my own thing because I could not find a good flexible role in our industry. Um, you are the so I had child of resilience, Denise, and I think... Um, <laughs> You know, if we if we did if we did want to look at, you know, coming together and kind of teaching skills to the women who are coming up behind us, the skills around resilience, around tenacity, <clears throat> around selling yourself, around working with ambiguity, um, you know, these are the skills that we need to teach. And you know, I'm, I'm happy to start to sign up and and do that. Absolutely, yes. and I'm going to lay. Sorry, Alex, we we didn't quite hear that. I was just going to say, I, I would layer that with, you know, creating flexible roles for women in the workforce so that they can, that, that, so they have a, a great opportunity to come back to work. Um, Reskilling um, when, when they come back to work because there's, there's been a 12-month or an 18-month gap since they've been in the workforce yes. and to rebuild their confidence. They have the skills, um, uh, but just to reskill in their particular, particular area of expertise and of course, the big one is childcare. Um, when, we, when families are paying, you know, close to the, 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 the woman's or the, the man's salary uh, it, to send their kids to childcare, um, we really, as a as society, society, as a, a broader issue, need to get that nailed. Exactly. Uh, a comment from Rachel, um, who's looking at us right now. Um, Jane, she disagrees with you. Leo's the hires represent who applies. More than likely the roles were never publicly advertised and were filled based on who they knew, uh, which, again, was certainly one of the comments on Mumbrella this week as well. Um, yeah. I'm actually really... Ex I, I don't know about that. I think, you know, I, we'll never know is the answer to that. We don't know what their hiring policies are. We don't know what their, um, you know, their programs around hiring are. And the bottom line is that we'll never know. I would mm. like to believe, though, that we are, you know, that that team was not personally handpicked, you know, for white men, you know, in this agency doing the job. I find it hard to believe that that, you know, that they went out of their way to say, we're just going to hire white men, mainly because I have respect for the clients of Leo Burnett. I have respect for the women of Leo Burnett and I do feel that these discussions in workplaces are actually out there now. This is not the 90s. This is not the 80s. So, so I would like to believe, although I take your point, Rachel, I'm not saying that that does not happen, but there are really smart clients of Leo Burnett and agencies generally that are going to start asking questions if these things are no longer coincidental. So, well, certainly, yes. Certainly after the present this week, Jane, that's absolutely yes. going to happen. Yes. Um, Dana makes the point about flexibility for dads as well. Um, I'm personally quite excited about the role that we in media and advertising can play on this issue. Um, I think that because of, you know, because uh, a lot of the things that we create are in the public domain and in society, that we have a real opportunity here to change the dialogue in society 
by presenting a more realistic view of, you know, of Australia and what's going on. So more diversity and diversity comes in so many ways, um, yeah. not only in gender but in race, in socioeconomic, in age. Um, I think, again, as an industry, we have an opportunity uh, to really make it, to really have some kind of impact. Um, and I'm um, that we drive bit of red, um, on this one in that um, I think we have a much bigger problem looming ahead of us in the next 10 years that will really dwarf this notion of flexible workplace and particularly maternity slash paternity leave. Um, you know, and, and this is, you know, it's to do with the ageing population. It's to do with the fact that we're all living longer, that a lot of us now are going to be responsible for ageing or sick parents, uh, disabled or ill people in our lives. This whole notion around carers leave will eventually dwarf what we see now as this massive challenge around maternity leave. And that, you know, it's just the law of the numbers and, and what's going on in the industry that that will happen. You know, when I think about how to deal with that as an employer, I think one of the things that we're fixated on is this notion of a full-time employee and the benefits and the overhead costs associated with that. As an industry and more broadly in the market, we are going to have to start to get more comfortable with the idea of contract and contract workers that don't come with all the nice benefits of being locked in, but do provide the flexibility around contracting that could be a win-win for the business as well as for the individual. We all shy away at this notion of not having annual leave and fixed benefits around sick leave and those allowances, but at mm. the same time, we want this flexibility in the workplace. And there's a break point here where it has to make sense financially for an organisation as well as for the people who are going to be looking for extended periods of leave. And those extended periods of leave could be, I don't know, having a baby, caring yeah. for an aged parent, overcoming illness, pursuing a sport so you can reach Olympic level, studying yeah. for a master's in a year. These are the types of benefits that I think people are going to be looking for in organisations in the next five to ten years. That's going to dwarf the conversations around, oh, my God, I need to have a baby. Yep. Great point, Sarah Jane. Alex, yeah, would you like to make off the red chair? Yeah, good, on, <laughs> good on you. Uh, Alex, <laughs> would you like to make some final points on this issue before we quickly move to events of our media week and what's been on your radar? Well, I think um, I think that probably the um, Leo Burnett's um, uh, discussion and news um, and uh, broadcast and that going uh, viral in social media was a a, a, a big um, wake up call again mm -hmm. for our, our industry in regards to diversity. Um, and whilst it is played negatively, uh, negative impact on that brand. It has some positivities. It has some po the positivities that, again, we have the opportunity to open up the conversation about uh, gender and to re-look really at um, w where the opportunities for improvement are. And it also gives us a platform like this one to have deeper discussions about how we can improve our industry. That's exactly right. Um, I would like to see more action. Um, and, you know, Peggy's list is an example of how I'm trying to make a, even a small difference. Um, I, this, as you would all know, you know, your followers of media, this issue, it seems to flame up once a year, once every two years. The next issue that will flame up will be skill shortages. The next issue that will flame up will be, you know, we just, it, there are four or five issues that just seem to flame. We all get very upset about it and then we go away until the next time. I'd like to start seeing some more action. Um, around some of these issues. Um, and again, small intentional steps, not an either note, either note change, but small intentional steps, bottom, bottom up, as Jane said as well. Quickly, let's move on to our media week. Jane, there's some things that have been on your radar this week, aside from the issues that we've been talking about today. You know, it's been a little bit of a week in a vacuum for me here, Denise. Um, you know, we're coming up through budget strategy planning. I must say that I've really had my head down under the sand um, for a lot of this week, just generally following a lot of the movements that are going on in the industry. You know, we're seeing Fairfax laying off a whole lot more people. 
Um, again, you know, we're still seeing duress in terms of the traditional media players. So following along with that and, you know, really thinking a lot about people who are having to make, make significant career changes and take different steps in their lives. Um, and if any of them are out there listening today, a lot of us have been in that position. Uh, there's always a life after leaving an organisation that you've been in for a while and there's a lot of opportunity going on in the market. So generally just watching the moves um, of the people around the industry. We're coming into events and awards season. Uh, I've been doing a lot of judging for, you know, for B&T and for various publications uh, over the last few weeks. So seeing some very exciting things coming up. I was judging uh, Specialist Agency of the Year and Employer of the Year for one of the groups. It's really exciting and motivating to see a lot of people-focused initiatives that are focused on the greater good happening inside of agencies and the market in general right now. Uh, a lot of time and effort and focus on people, their careers, training and development. And that's been really heartening uh, for me to see and it pertains specifically to a lot of the issues that we're discussing today. Excellent. Well done, Jane. Uh, awards season is certainly upon us. I was at the Media Eye Awards on Wednesday night. Congratulations to APN Outdoor for their win as sales uh, sales team of the year. Alex, your media week, what's been on your radar? Uh, um, uh, as you know, that I'm in the uh, customer experience space. Yes. So this week has been a week of epic fails in regards to customer experience. Uh, we've had uh, JJ's Jeans. Uh, you know, put a, a slogan on, on their T-shirts about uh, bullying behaviour, not sitting next to uh, girls. Uh, I can't really remember exactly the slogan, but uh, that blew up in social media. Uh, not, a, not a great customer experience or not a great brand experience for JJ's there. We've had Apple down in Melbourne, one of their stores, chuck out a bunch of uh, school kids because they looked and sounded a particular way. They didn't sort of um, uh, fit the uh, ideal customer, what they expected, um, and that was on top of their CEO uh, talking about uh, diversity at Apple, um, and all that was kept caught on security cameras. We've had the taxi industry in Victoria do an epic fail in social media, um, and, uh, and uh, the... Um, Social media chimed in in regards to comparing them to yet again to Uber and uh, what experiences they have. Woolworths, oh my God! <laughs> Television yeah. goes to air uh, where they have their, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the hostess with the most the most fittest woman uh, in Australia eating dirt and calling uh, their audience weird. Uh, so Woolworths pulls that off here. So some mega fails there. Uh, this week uh, for brands. And, and perhaps, Alex, that touches on something we've been talking about, about who is making these decisions, who's coming up with these ideas. Is it indeed that 70% of white 30-year-old males that are in creative agencies that are making perhaps some slightly flawed decisions aren't in touch with their market? Um, just as a point to tie, to tie it all up. Um, uh, do you know, actually, just there, do you know if it's better? Sorry. Um, the Bechdel test is something that I think we should all be aware of. So that's a test that every commercial that you see, you look at, uh, I think it's something like a woman who isn't subservient to a man, isn't doing housework. There's actually five sort of points that you should look at for any ad. And then you know that, and then there's a Bechdel test. Uh, that you apply that to based on that criteria. Uh, just, for me, that reminds me of something awesome I saw on Facebook uh, that a friend shared with me this week, which was uh, what Richard Scarry has done with his books for children. I don't know how many of you out there grew up with the Richard Scarry books um, that are really aimed at that, you know, sort of three to ten-year-old. They've re-released most of the series of books uh, which had... Um, handsome men and pretty women and very gender stereotyped with the women in the kitchen and they've re-released all of those books to be gender neutral and they've taken out any of the descriptive uh, phrases around being pretty or handsome or whatever and that to me is just so brilliant it's such a great sign of what we can expect for our kids in the future where people are people 
and and we're all just kind of trying to do the best we can and put our pants on one leg at a time. Um, I just wish for everyone, including my daughters, I mean, you call yours uh, Lucifer and Satan, Jane, wait till they get to 13 and 15, which is what I have. And I know Alex has some um, kids, some teenage kids as well. Um, it's certainly a challenging time. Yeah. But that's another, that's a story for another day. Look, thank you. Uh, for me, sorry, I just wanted to touch on uh, audit results released today for magazine newspapers. Uh, a downward traje trajectory continues is what the trade media said this morning um, and, and really, um, you know, what Jane said this morning, uh, just a moment ago. Sorry about um, you know feeling for the for the people that are perhaps involved in some of these organisations that are maybe losing staff and so on. Um, very much, you know, my thoughts go out to them. And as Jane says, there are many opportunities out there in our industry, uh, to say the least. Thank you so much for joining me today. I think it's been a great discussion. Unfortunately, Chris didn't make it back in. Um, perhaps you know something came up in his house. Um, next week we'll be talking skill shortages, another big issue in the market. Um, I'll be joined by Yasmin from AOL. I'll be joined by Adam Furness from Radium One and I'll be joined by Sebastian Graham from Bohemia. Um, we'll be talking about the big issue of skill shortages, somewhat interrelated to what we've been talking about today. So that point will certainly be raised. I'm just going to turn the